Lactofermentation is a chemical process that preserves food, enhances flavor, and gives the food unique functional properties due to the presence of probiotic microorganisms. Fermented vegetables have played a significant role in helping me to achieve total resolution of a severe case of inflammatory bowel disease. Nearly two years after being diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, I discovered that there seems to be a relationship between a dysbiotic gut microbiome and the pathogenesis of IBD. I decided to implement my own gut microbiome optimizing protocol with the aim to return my gut microbiome to eubiosis. Fermented vegetables were an important part of this protocol because of their probiotic properties and potential to positively impact the human gut microbiome. Just to be clear, I am not a doctor or a dietitian. The information in this video is simply what I've personally found to be helpful and should not be taken as medical advice. You should always consult and listen to your doctor before making any dietary changes with the intent to treat an illness so that you can hopefully avoid dangerous consequences. There are different methods and ways to approach fermenting vegetables. In the past, I've made fermented vegetables with and without salt, I've used culture starters, and I've used different fermentation vessels with different air locking mechanisms. I've settled on using salt to make my ferments and using a specific water sealed air locking lid designed for fermenting vegetables. The fermentation process requires an anaerobic environment, meaning without oxygen. This environment allows probiotic lactic acid bacteria to proliferate and produce enough lactic acid to preserve the vegetables. Salt helps to encourage the growth of lactic acid bacteria, prevent the growth of pathogenic microorganisms, and keep the vegetables firmer and crunchier. The most important thing to remember during the fermentation process is to keep the vegetables submerged under water. If any of the vegetables are exposed to oxygen for too long during the fermentation process, they can become contaminated with pathogenic microorganisms, such as mold, and ruin the whole batch. If the vegetables stay fully submerged and the proper amount of salt is added, the result should be a perfect and delicious ferment every time. So the first thing I'm going to do is choose my vegetables. Almost anything can be fermented. However, for anyone struggling with IBD, be careful when choosing foods to ferment because high amounts of insoluble fiber, AKA roughage, can potentially be really irritating to inflamed intestines. So if inflammation or other symptoms are present, I would recommend using skinned and de-seeded cucumbers, squash, and zucchini in the beginning to maximize soluble fiber and minimize insoluble fiber. As you hopefully begin to feel better and become less inflamed, your tolerability for insoluble fiber should increase and you can then progress to consuming other fermented foods that have higher levels of insoluble fiber. Once the vegetables have been chosen, wash and dry them and then cut them up so that they fit inside the jar just below the shoulder. This makes it easier to keep them submerged in the brine. Once they're cut appropriately, set the jar in a food scale and then zero out the scale using the tear function. When the scale reads zero grams, add the vegetables to the jar and then add water to the jar. I recommend using clean, filtered water so that it is free of chlorine and other chemicals that may inhibit the fermentation process. Make sure to add enough water to the jar so that the vegetables can be fully submerged. Record the weight of the vegetables plus water in grams, which is 755 grams for this ferment. Now, we need to calculate how much salt to add to the ferment based on the combined weight of the vegetables and water. When fermenting vegetables, the generally agreed upon salt concentration of the entire mixture should be around 2 to 3% for most vegetables, though there is some variability depending on the vegetable. I like to be right in the middle with a 2.5% total salt concentration, and I pretty much stay at this percentage regardless of the vegetable. So, in order to calculate how much salt needs to be added to have a 2.5% total salt concentration, I use this common fermentation equation. Vegetable weight plus water weight times 0 0.025 equals the amount of salt to add. The reason we include the weight of the vegetables in our calculation and don't just use the weight of the water is because vegetables contain a significant amount of water themselves and we want to account for that water as well. So, take the combined weight of the vegetables and water, which is 755 grams, and multiply by 0 0.025. This comes out to about 19 grams of salt. Once the amount of salt we needed is calculated and recorded, grab an empty mason jar and pour the water that is in the ferment jar into the empty mason jar. Set the jar of water on the scale and zero it out using the tear function. From here, add the amount of salt that was calculated. Put on a lid and shake the jar until the salt has dissolved in the water. Then remove the lid and pour the water back into the ferment jar that's full of vegetables. You now have the perfect volume of water for this ferment and the appropriate amount of salt. 
Just for kicks, I'll show you the exact salt concentration we're at for the entire mixture. So the weight of the vegetables plus the water that we calculated was 755 grams. We multiplied that by 0 0.025 and got about 19 grams of salt. We then added that salt to the water and vegetables, which gives us a total mass of 774 grams. So, to calculate the exact percentage, we divide 19 grams of salt by the total mass of water, vegetables, and salt, which is 774 grams. This gives us 0.0245, which is an almost perfect 2.5% total salt concentration. Then we need a lid. There are tons of nifty little fermentation lids online that are awesome. I've been using a genius contraption from Krautsource. This is a water-sealed air-locking lid. It has a built-in spring mechanism that keeps the vegetables submerged beneath the brine and a water-filled moat that allows CO2 to escape the brine but doesn't let anything back inside. This helps to maintain an anaerobic environment as the fermentation process occurs. This specific apparatus is made of 316 stainless steel, so it's resistant to corrosion from acidic or saline solutions, making it suitable for use in fermentation. Now a fancy fermenting lid like mine is not a necessity, I just personally like to use lids designed to aid the fermentation process. I recommend doing a little research before deciding what type of lid, weight, or other apparatus to use for your ferments. I repeat the process with other vegetables and flavor them with garlic, serrano peppers, or jalapenos, and different herbs of which my favorite is dill. If you're struggling with IBD or another digestive issue, you may want to stick with just salt and water for a while before experimenting with different types of flavoring. So once the lids are on, the vegetables are submerged in the brine, and the moats are filled with water, I place the jars somewhere out of the way and let them sit and ferment. I normally let my vegetables ferment for a full 7 days at a temperature around 70 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit before refrigerating and eating them. Warmer temperatures will speed up the fermentation process, and cooler temperatures will slow it down, so just keep that in mind. During the seven days, I check the ferments every day to make sure that the vegetables are submerged under the water and so that I can scoop out any floaters that might cause contamination. I then resubmerge the vegetables and let them continue fermenting. The brine should start turning cloudy, that's totally normal, and it should bubble periodically as the fermentation takes place. This is what the ferment looks like after seven days. So, I'm going to remove the fermentation lid, put on a regular lid, and put it in the fridge. Once it's cold enough for my liking, it's ready to be consumed. The vegetables should taste sour when finished, and somewhat similar to pickled food made with vinegar. Some other things that are commonly encountered during the fermentation process are the presence of calm yeast and mold. 
Calm yeast is a thin white film that can develop on the surface of the brine and typically isn't dangerous. It can just be scooped out of the jar and the vegetables below the brine should be fine. Mold, on the other hand, usually presents itself as raised fuzzy spots that can be red, black, pink, or green and can be harmful if eaten. So don't eat moldy vegetables. If you're unsure about whether or not something is calm yeast or mold, I recommend erring on the side of caution and discarding the whole batch. Better safe than sorry. But once again, as long as the vegetables stay fully submerged and the proper amount of salt is added, the result should be a perfect and delicious ferment every time. I would recommend going to culturesforhealth.com or some other good source on fermented foods and do some more research on calm yeast and mold so that you know what to look for, what to do if either appears, and the best ways to prevent them. So that's my preferred method of making fermented vegetables. But there are different ways to approach this and many other resources that can be found online for you to reference. I really like Cultures for Health, Cultured Guru is a good one, and there are countless YouTube videos that can be found on this topic as well. I think these foods taste delicious and they really were a big part of the puzzle that ended up helping me to achieve total resolution of IBD. Fermented foods are known to be excellent sources of probiotic microorganisms that have the potential to improve the composition of the gut microbiome and overall health by outcompeting pathogens for resources, producing short-chain fatty acids, secreting antimicrobial agents, contributing to immune homeostasis, and producing vitamins. Some other notable health benefits of consuming fermented foods are that they aid in the prevention of cardiovascular disease, prevention of cancer, improvement of gastrointestinal disorders like inflammatory bowel disease, and producing anti-allergenic effects. Having a healthy gut microbiome is extremely important for overall health, and consuming fermented foods is a great way to build a strong gut microbiome.